Good afternoon, everyone in Lukman Nation. Thank you so much for joining me today, this Saturday, on this special edition of Lukman Nation, the People's Power Hour in Lukman Nation. I am the People's Prophetess, Jackie Lukman. Really, really appreciate you hanging out with me today. You could be anywhere else on your Saturday afternoon on this holiday weekend, and it's very fortuitous that we are having this conversation on this particular holiday weekend because it is absolutely connected to the celebrations of the legacy of the doctor of uh, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and his exhortations to end U.S. militarism, racism, and poverty that exacerbates the oppression of the poor domestically and around the world. So yeah, this conversation is timely if no other conversation is on this weekend. So, hey, thanks so much for joining me, taking your time out to come and hang out with me and my special guest today on the People's Power Hour in Lukman Nation. But let's get some housekeeping stuff out of the way before we get into it. If you're watching on Black Power Media, subscribe to Black Power Media so you can get a notification for when everybody, anybody goes live, uploads content so that you don't miss anything on the channel. You can also do the same thing over at Lukeman Nation on YouTube so you don't miss anything. You can follow and support Black Power Media on Patreon, patreon.com slash Black Power Media. But did you know you can also support Lukeman Nation on Patreon too? Absolutely. Patreon.com slash Lukeman Nation. Appreciate you. Thank you so much. Look here. Let's get into this because we've I've, I've got an hour, a little less than an hour with this brother. So I don't want to waste a lot of our time. But real quick, what's going on, you all in the chat? I see you, Ricky Ryan, Pamela Jones, Toby Quaker Anarchist, Toby Roberts, Sugar Sham, Lisa Catlett, Miriam Francis, Terrence, David Silberg, Goddess Crew, all the usual suspects, Alice Marquez, Fly Society, Strand, uh, My Written Voice, Peelin's Ghost. Thank y'all, thank y'all, thank y'all for joining me. And look here, let me, let's just get to it. I'm happy to be joined today by none other than Ajamu Baraka, uh, the national organizer, although that's not your title anymore, of the Black Alliance for Peace. And I, I so, so correct us on how we should address you uh, these days, sir. Well, I'm really just I'm, a, I'm just a member now. I mean, I'm I'm on the coordinating committee. I'm the the coordinating committee elected me as chair, uh, but I'm also going to be heading up our work around the uh, People Center Human Rights, uh, the People Center Human Rights uh, Project, North South Project. So that's what I'm doing now. Fantastic. And yeah, don't don't believe this. He's just a member of uh, the Black Alliance. No, that's I actually don't look at any of us uh, who are members of the Black Alliance for Peace as just members of the Black Alliance for Peace, because as a frequently says, we some bad Africans and I, I am I am not 
I'm going to pretend like I'm humble in believing that's true of myself, myself and everybody else that I organize with. So look, Ajamu, we are embarking on the occasion to commemorate uh, the birthday of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And we African organizers, we anti-imperialist organizers uh, always focus on really the part of his uh, legacy that led to his assassination directly because it wasn't his work toward integration. It wasn't to his work you know, challenging Jim Crow that got him assassinated. It was his exhortation that U.S. imperialism through the triple evils of militarism, uh, racism, and poverty needed to end his condemnation of capitalism as a part of that equation and the demands that in order to address the uh, racial inequality and economic inequality that is uh, uh, precipitated uh, through racism, a redistribution of wealth has to happen uh, and this capitalist system has to change. So before we get into this discussion about Ukraine specifically, as an African anti-imperialist organizer, how should we be thinking about um, commemorating the legacy of Dr. King, particularly as we are dealing with this issue of continued U.S. militarism in Ukraine. Well, first, thank you so much uh, for inviting me. It's good to be back here at Live My Nation, where uh, Africans have a chance to really engage uh, in some serious conversations, conversations we have to engage in if we are going to have the kind of political and and ideological clarity we need uh, to advance our people's struggle. Um, this is a very important weekend, as, as always, when we co commemorate uh, Dr. King's birthday. And we also connect um, Dr. King's assassination. And as you know, and many of your um, uh, uh, listeners know, viewers know, that the Black Alliance of Peace launched on the commemoration of Dr. King's assassination. Uh, back in 2017. And we did that because we wanted people to remember, uh, as you said earlier, that um, Dr. King and the movement that Dr. King, that created Dr. King, uh, was one of the victims of the counter-revolutionary process in this country. And as you said, what made Dr. King a threat, what made the developing movement uh, a threat was the uh, uh, enhancement of the understanding that it couldn't just be a, a question of, of civil rights, um, a question of race, uh, but that those factors had to be connected to the issues of class uh, and, and capitalism. And when Dr. King began to oppose, finally, after a number of organizations, a number of our uh, Black Liberation Movement organizations condemned the Vietnam War, condemned militarism, uh, and U.S. imperialism, when Dr. King finally in 1967, April the 4th, uh, came out in opposition to uh, to the war and made a very important philosophical connection. You say you, we can't, he, he couldn't no longer uh, advocate this notion of nonviolence to uh, uh, our people in the so-called ghettos uh, while the U.S. continued to use violence to advance its particular interests. Uh, that was a moral dilemma, in fact, a moral contradiction that he felt he had to address, and that's what he did. So his opposition to, to the war, which caused a, a sensation among the liberal class, uh, was, uh, was pivotal in him being targeted for eventual elimination. It was the opposition to the war and, simultaneously, the commitment to build a poor people's campaign that centered the, the, uh, the contradictions of the capitalist system that creates poverty, uh, not only among Africans, but among the vast population in this country. So those two factors and the emergence of the uh, militant uh, revolutionary uh, tendencies among the uh, Black Liberation Movement um, put a, a huge uh, target, well, expanded the target on Dr. King and he was eventually taken out uh, in, in Memphis, as we all know. So 
this weekend is a weekend in which we, we commemorate Dr. King, but we commemorate our movement. Um, and it's important that we do that because we know that part of the process, part of the ideological process of the enemy is to co-op uh, our leadership, to redefine our movement and its objectives, uh, to uh, incorporate it into this, uh, this Obama um, uh, toward a more perfect union kind of BS, uh, as opposed to the, the opposition that it really was, an opposition that understood that we weren't going to be able to fully realize our human rights. We would not be able to have peace until we put a, a uh, until we un overturn the continuity of this settler colonial project and the settler colonial state. Uh, and so this is important that we take back our own interpretations of what Dr. King and the movement meant for us. So it's, it's I think is important that we have people across the country this weekend commemorating Dr. King by engaging in anti-war activity, anti-imperialist activity, demos, teach-ins, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, because if we don't take back and redefine for ourselves uh, who Dr. King was, our movement, um, and the radical um, uh, uh, tasks and responsibilities we have today, then we'll find ourselves confused like we see so many others out there today. And it is that confusion that I want to talk about because there is no way that we can do exactly what you just said, take back the uh, a narrative on Dr. King and advance, continue and advance the anti-imperialist, anti-war struggle under this cloud of ridiculous confusion that is hovering over whatever the so-called left is supposed to be in the United States. And I've got uh, right now uh, centering around Ukraine and I've got some opinions on some of that, which we'll get into a little bit later, but we need to be clear on how we got here, how this, not we, we need to be clear on how this conflict in Ukraine emerged. And it was not a situation where so many folks on the left would like to believe uh, that, you know, Russia just invaded Ukraine uh, unprovoked. I'm just going to take a few minutes to highlight a literal paper trail that led to all of the diplomatic failures. And, and those failures were intentional, by the way. I'm going to show that to you. I'm going to give you the links to all of these resources in the description at the end of this show. Not going to take the time to drop them in the chat because, look, let's just get through it. So how, how, did, how did this country get here? So let's start with, and, and by the way, some of the resources I'm going to share with you, they're not all so-called left resources. Um, they're not, you know, uh, uh, all uh, 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 even anti-imperialist sources. Some of them, honestly, are right-wing sources, <laughs> to tell you the truth, but even they will tell the truth every once in a while. Uh, so let's see, let's get into these. And let me see if I can share, if this is gonna let me share my screen. Yep, all right, I hope you can see it. This is from Yale Macmillan Center. This is a very long, um, literal, almost step-by-step -step, uh, examination of the diplomatic talks between the United States, the Russian Federation, Vladimir Putin, Sergei Lavrov, Joe Biden, uh, Jake Sullivan, and, and their allies about what led up to this conflict in Ukraine. And the key points that you need to understand uh, is that the major issues in this conflict are the refusal of Ukraine to fully implement the measures agreed to by the Russian Federation, Ukrainian government, French government, and German leaders at the Minsk uh, Accords in February 2015. They entered into this agreement to end the conflict between Ukrainian troops and they call them pro-Russian separatists. Remember, this is a, a, an imperialist source that 
actually tells the truth about a lot of these details, even though they do it with a decidedly imperialist slant. So they're calling these folks pro-Russian separatists uh, in eastern Ukraine that even they admit began in 2014. So this idea that nothing happened in 2014 that we need to be concerned about in the current conflict, Yale University even says that's bullshit, okay? They talk about that uh, when Putin made his address to the Russian people announcing the special military action in uh, February, he did it to protect the people in Donbass who for eight years now have been facing humiliation and genocide perpetuated by the Kiev regime, the Kiev government in, in, in uh, Ukraine. U.S. media hasn't talked about this civil war uh, that has been going on in Ukraine um, that the Kiev government uh, unleashed against the ethnic Russian-speaking people in the eastern region of Ukraine. Yale University just admits that that, that happened. Okay. They also point out something very interesting here, that since 2014, since the start of that civil war, Russian citizenship has been granted to more than 700,000 regions in the eastern regions, the contested regions of Donetsk and Luhansk. So those people, ethnic Russians, always have been anyway. They actually voted in a referendum to be independent of the Ukrainian government. Um, Ukraine did not honor those referendum votes and honoring those referendum votes was a part of the Minsk Accords. The Ukrainian government was supposed to uh, infer upon the Donbass and Luhansk regions special status that would grant them autonomy outside of the Kiev government, the Ukrainian government refused to do it. And all throughout this document, I've got a bunch of highlighted places. Uh, Putin brings this up. Other Russian officials bring up the fact that Ukraine refused to adhere to that part of the Minsk Accords to grant autonomy to the Donetsk and Luhansk regions. And guess who else brought it up? The G7. The seven countries that are the, uh, the, the six countries that are the allies to the United States, they also brought up the fact that it is in the best interest of avoiding this conflict, conflict that they knew was coming if Ukraine just honors that part of the Minsk Accords, which is what Russia was asking for, really. The other part uh, of this was that, um, of course, the cessation of any further advancement of NATO toward Russia's borders. That's always been a security concern of Russia. The United States and its allies have always ignored Russia's concerns about this as if Russia doesn't have any valid security concerns about NATO uh, operating uh, in countries along its border that were formerly a part of the Russian Federation, by the way. Um, this is very important. Because as this uh, article points out, some of the meetings that led up to the uh, before this conflict where these diplomat diplomats got together and tried to hash this out, some of the meetings were primarily concerned with Russia's proposal that the U.S. and NATO provided with security guarantees and it would prohibit further eastward enlargement of NATO, something that Russia has been asking for for decades, by the way. Um, and this is very important. The talks, named for ones agreed by the leaders of France, Germany, Russia, and Ukraine at Normandy on the 70th, 70th anniversary of D-Day in 2014, in order to end the conflict between Ukrainian troops and pro-Russian separatists who had taken control of the, Net, the Donetsk and Luhansk regions in eastern Ukraine earlier that spring, produced the Minsk agreements of September 14 and February 2015. There were two sets of agreements. Those agreements, especially the one negotiated after the ceasefire agreed in September 2014, had collapsed, frequently recurred to as Minsk II, sought to end the conflict by not only establishing a ceasefire and mutual withdrawal of weapons, but also by providing for constitutional reform that would give the predominantly Russian-speaking regions in eastern Ukraine a special status and would devolve power from Kiev to those regions and give them a substantial degree of autonomy because they voted 
to literally secede from Ukraine. More than anything else, it was the refusal of Ukraine, Yale University says this, to implement the provisions of Minsk II, especially the provision that would give the predominantly Russian-speaking regions a special constitutional status that caused Russia to threaten military action against Ukraine uh, time and time. Again, Putin and Russian Foreign Minister Lavrov made it clear in meetings and press conferences that the key to resolving the situation, all of this could have been avoided if Ukraine had just fully implemented Minsk II and they kept saying it and the U.S. and NATO kept ignoring it. And Ukraine, by the way. Uh, it's good to know at this point that among the signatories of the Minsk agreements, Angela Merkel has recently admitted that the signatories uh, of the Minsk agreement, Germany, France, uh, uh, the United States, uh, and Ukraine, never intended ever to actually adhere to the accords. She literally said, and this is uh, published in a, uh, a publication called Modern Diplom Diplomacy. She said this on December 7th, the 2014 Minsk agreement was an attempt to buy time for Ukraine. Ukraine used this time to become stronger, as you can see today. Ukraine in 2014 and 15 and Ukraine today are not the same. It was clear for everyone, she said, that the conflict was suspended and the problem was not resolved, but it was exactly what gave Ukraine priceless time. She admitted that uh, France, Germany, and Ukraine never intended to abide by the Minsk Accords, neither one of them. They knew that Ukraine was not going to abide by the Accords, and they were fine because what they intended was to use that time to do exactly what is happening now, what has been happening since February, and that is to flood Ukraine with weapons and all kinds of material support from the US and its allies to fight this proxy war against Russia. They wanted a war with Russia using Ukraine and they intentionally violated Minsk to, to do it. So when we look at uh, this, comment that was made by Sergei Lavrov about a treaty that most people don't know a damn thing about because we don't know anything about foreign policy. Uh, we're terrible on it in this country. But Russia cited a 1999 charter for the reason that they felt their security guarantees were ignored and violated. Uh, this is, uh, I can't read um, the, this, the text of this article, but I can tell you what's in it because I did a monologue on this back in February uh, for by any means necessary. He's talking about the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe or the OCE, OSCE Charter that was signed in Istanbul in 1999. The OSCE Charter states that no country can uh, beef up its security at the cost or by threatening another member state's security. So out of the countries that are part of this charter, and there are uh, 57 OSCE member states that cover three continents, North America, Europe, and Asia, the policies the OSCE deliberates over are like security issues, arms control, terrorism, blah, blah, blah. But the charter states, and this is the actual language, that countries should be free to choose their own security arrangements and alliances, but it specifies that in doing so, countries will not strengthen their security at the expense of the security of other states. And this is the rationale that Russia raised for mobilizing troops inside its own border in response to the US and NATO forces that were mobilizing troops in all of the countries surrounding Russia in the months 
previous to the military action in Ukraine. Um, but, but the yes. Can, can, can I jump in though? Absolutely. Because what you are laying out, I mean, is is incredibly important. But you know what? It is something that these steps, these agreements, these these uh, conversations between the U.S. and NATO and the Russians, as you indicated, that these are things that happen that anybody who was serious about trying to really understand this conflict could have access to. Mm -hmm. These are not Kremlin talking points that you just shared from this Yale uh, source. This is a step-by-step -step, uh, rendering of what led to the to to the conflict. A conflict, as you said, was clearly avoidable, but it was not avoidable because basically the policy of the U.S. Uh, and some uh, powerful nations in Western Europe. Uh, some powerful capitalists in Western Europe was to uh, to uh, uh, incite what they wanted wanted to be a limited war in the Donbas uh, that would allow them then to do a few things: one, to disarticulate the European economy from the Russians, uh, uh, to shut down uh, Nord Stream two, uh, mm -hmm. and to weaken Russia as a nation state in order to also weaken the growing partnership between Russia and the Chinese. So these were the objectives of the main objectives of, of, of these policies. And, but they needed this conflict in order for those, those, those policies to be implemented. And, and what's important about this is that's what makes it so bizarre that you have left forces uh, who can also have access to th this information, who can see the, the unfolding of the logic of this conflict, uh, to see basically that for them to take up uh, a line similar to the line that was propagated by Western imperialist uh, media outlets, that one day evil uh, Putin woke up and decided to just invade uh, Ukraine, uh, this unprovoked attack, for them to take up that kind of position also is unconscionable. It is mm -hmm. unprincipled. It is an open collaboration with the enemy. Yep. And it, it demonstrates not just a, a, a rightist tendency among the so-called left, but it demonstrates that that element of the left doesn't really even exist. You can't really object, objectively define those forces as left forces. These are forces that are in complete, total alignment with the policies uh, and the strategies of full spectrum dominance of the imperialist strategy of the U.S. and the West. So, you know, for us who raise these issues, because we can get into the details of this all day, the real question is, where do you stand politically and mm -hmm. ideologically? Okay. Why are you engaged in this kind of collaboration? Why do you critique and criticize those of us who take a consistent anti-imperialist position, who say that we keep a laser focus on our primary enemy, not only the enemy of African people, but the enemy of collective humanity? We say that basically, you know, uh, when, when the brother uh, got uh, tasered to death a few days ago in DC, uh, the, the, the folks who did that, that taser, they weren't Russians, they weren't right. Chinese, they weren't Iranians, they were good old settlers, settler America, so-called Americans, okay? Mm -hmm. And we're supposed to be mobilized in support of that? What kind of self-respecting African can be in alignment with a, 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 a political project that includes NATO? Right. The answer is you can't be self-respecting, you can't be conscious. You got to be an, an open collaborator. And so these elements who call themselves so-called leftists, these are white supremacist uh, nationalists uh, who are in alignment with the, the goals and the objectives of our enemy, and they need to be called out. And we should not be in any way self-conscious about that or concerned about uh, 
uh, not telling two sides of the story. What two mm. sides? It, exactly. And, and see, this is the thing, because there is some discourse. And by the way, folks, that little five, seven minute rundown that I just gave you, that that's that's what dialectical materialism is. It's just, just you know, examining the paper trail to come to your conclusions about who the enemy really is. Um, and, and what's happening on the so-called left is a whole lot of not that. And, and it's a lot of honestly intellectual and uh, uh, just it's it's just lazy because what we're talking about here, we're not talking about something in the abstract. We're talking about a very real thing that has emerged. And this is this specifically this Ukraine Solidarity Network. This is a project of, I think, uh, Howie Hawkins, a bunch of other people. He has a bunch of other people who are signatories on, on this. But if you, okay, first of all, it's difficult for me as an African. It's not difficult. It's impossible for me as an African to be in solidarity with a country that has a, as long a history of Nazi collaboration as Ukraine does. And this is outside of 2014. We're talking way back in World War II, where Stepan Bandera was the uh, Nazi collaborator henchman in Ukraine, uh, carrying out his own massacres on behalf of the Fuhrer and the Reich. And then the CIA comes in after the end of World War II and props up the neo-Nazis in the government of Ukraine. And that faction of Nazi sympathizing Ukrainians, they haven't gone away. So you have a Ukraine that has, has at least since World War II been, uh, some were uh, Russians because they were formerly a part of Russia, but the other half hated Russia so much because they were neo-Nazis, because they were Nazis, basically. I, I, as an African, I'm not going to be in solidarity with a country with a history like that. And I'm certainly not going to be a, in solidarity with a country that has a, cu a current government that is actually fascist, still fascist, with Volodymyr uh, Zelensky banning opposition parties. They are illegal now in the country. Banning labor unions. What kind of leftist who claims to be organizing on behalf of the working class and poor, how are you in solidarity with a government that bans labor unions and collective bargaining for its workers? They have banned uh, churches that they claim are affili affiliated with Russia, revoked citizenship of priests, and they have also targeted citizens, mostly in the eastern eth ethnic Russian regions, for being traitors, and they are being systematically targeted and rounding up, rounded up human rights violations committed again. All of that. So, so if. You are a so-called leftist and you see this happening with the history of Ukraine and in the current governor, government of Ukraine. How, how are you in solidarity with such a country? But here we have leftists who, Ajamu, are saying things like uh, they're calling this Putin's war, first of all, ignoring all that dialectical materialism we just did. Um, they are saying things like uh, they uh, support, oh, that Ukraine is, Ukraine is fighting a legitimate war of self-defense. No mention of Russia's uh, uh, valid security concerns and, and indeed the, for its survival of a nation and that they support the right of Ukraine to obtain the weapons it needs from any available source. Now, Ajamu, on this Martin Luther King Jr. Day weekend, the idea that any leftists are supporting of any country gaining the weapons it needs from any available source to fight a war that is clearly not one of self-defense and is clearly not a just war, that's bad enough. But understanding that in this country right now, it is still the working class and poor who are subjected to the continued oppression and degradation and human rights violation of having $100 billion or more shipped off to prop up Ukraine while homelessness 
rise while uh, workers are fighting for their rights in this country, um, while health care still is not a human right. I, how do you, what do we do with this? <laughs> you can't, you can't square it. You can't, you can't justify it. It's, it's, it's irreconcilable with, with left values. And that's, that's really the issue that you, you, the, 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 it, it is the, a, a left position should be, now that the war started, because it didn't have to happen. And we already uh, laid that out. A left position should be at minimum that the war should be ended, that there should be a negotiated settlement that the working classes that are engaged in, in fighting, well, is the working class and the petty bourgeoisie primarily in Ukraine, uh, that are engaged in this fighting who are dying on both sides. You know, it's not in their interest for this to continue. So this notion of you supporting U.S. policy, which is a policy that says they're going to continue to support Ukraine militarily until a military victory what you have signed on to basically is a never ending war, theoretically, even though we know it's going to end. But what you sign on also to is uh, with the possibility or almost the inevitability of a Russian military victory. What you sign on to is a justification for the possibility of a dangerous escalation that could very easily lead to a military confrontation between the West uh, and Russia. So this is the kind of, of ideological collaboration we see happening uh, with, with this conflict, very similar to what we saw among the European left in World War I, uh, where, they, uh, where, where the, the international uh, communist and socialist movement broke down as, uh, as the workers uh, aligned themselves with their bourgeoisie and in the interests of their national bourgeoisie. So you have these these national, these U.S. these U.S. nationalists who are objectively aligning themselves not only with the U.S. bourgeoisie, but the Western bourgeoisie, and at the the the, the center of that, and is unacknowledged is the fact that what they are doing is aligning themselves with white power. They are aligning themselves with the the interests of the hegemonic white West, because we all know that that even uh, though everybody doesn't say it openly, in particular the, the, the representatives of these various states in the global south, throughout the entire global south, everybody recognizes that if these freaks win, if the Western alliance is, is if they win, they will be emboldened in ways that will be threatening to everyone. It, it, a war between the West and, and China will be basically almost inevitable, okay? So they are. Un they understand that basically, it, this it, we can't have a victory by the West and these NATO forces. But yet these leftists, many of them who call themselves anti-imperialists, they would completely dismiss that as as um, uh, uh, Kremlin talking points or irrelevant. Or what they're pushing now is this kind of so-called balance, this uh, uh, equivalence where they will uh, equate uh, Western imperialism with what they uh, refer to as, as Russian or even Chinese imperialism, okay? Um, and those of us who, 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 who use dialectics as a method, who understand dialectics and history, we're saying that this is absurd. That basically, you know, we understand contradiction also. We understand that basically the major contradiction right now in the world is between the white uh, colonial capitalist West and the rest of us. You can't put the U.S. on the same level as as the Russians and the Chinese. Uh, uh, the U.S. with uh, 800 to 1,000 bases with a defense budget of $858 billion, uh, global command structures, okay? Uh, you can't be a, 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 a country that has a history of subversion, of warmongering, of destroying whole nations. How in the hell do you put them on the same level as the Russian and the Chinese, whatever the internal contradictions may be in those two countries? You see, that's arrogance. It's arrogant white supremacy. And it doesn't matter if it's being articulated by a person who's so, a so-called white person or a so-called person of color. It reflects the internalized 
a white supremacist worldview. We've got to call that out clearly. So it doesn't matter if it's Bill Fletcher or, or some other white supremacist. They have been completely uh, inundated with that worldview. And they turn around and try to condemn us because we have gone through the process of, of decolonization mentally. Mm. We can see clearly what the terms of struggle are. You know, and they want to accuse us uh, of not being balanced and not being objective. You know, look, like we can't think for ourselves. We understand right. the, the the contradictions. We understand the nature of the of the Russian state. We understand, you know, some of the internal contradictions even in China. Okay, we under, we, we remember what games were played in the run up to the the, the NATO attack on Libya. Uh, mm. Games played by the Russians and the Chinese. Mm -hmm. We understood mm -hmm. and we saw how they were prepared to throw Assad under the bus in Syria to advance their own particular interests, thinking they're going to <laughs> get some buy some time with the West when all they did was basically whet their appetite. Yeah, but we have the right and the responsibility to determine who our friends and enemies are. And strategically, when we determine who our friends and enemies are, we have permanent interests, you know, right. and we strategically determine how we advance those interests, who we work with, who we coalesce with, who we denounce when we need to. OK, because we can think and theorize for ourselves. See, but these arrogant white supremacists, they don't believe that. So they, you, you hear the buzzwords or you knee jerk imperialists or, you know, you just uh, uh, parroting the. The, uh, the 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 talking points from the Kremlin, like we need the Russians to tell us who our enemy is, that we need right. the Russians to tell us that we are in a fundamental contradictory relationship uh, to this colonial capitalist system, you know? So we fight against that, we struggle. We struggle against anybody who wants to pretend that we've got to, uh, 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 you know, uh, perform for white folks to demonstrate that we have some kind of uh, we understand some kind of balance and we sophisticated lady for that. And I, I, I've got you, we, we've got you for a good five more minutes. And I, I want to raise something that I thought about uh, a little bit last night. And I kind of thought that, you know, when you talk about how this kind of, of, of collaboration, this left collaboration with U.S. imperialism, which basically just makes them U.S. imperialists. They're imperialists and there's no, they have not earned the title left. Uh, they have, uh, 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 what's the word I'm looking at? They forfeited the title of left because people who are left don't act like this. That's that's not, the, the left doesn't do this. But when you have this, um, uh, um, what's the, 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 not an eight, but a, a, a kind of, of, of uh, in your core uh, allegiance with the empire that you may not have uh, wanted to admit to before, this is the kind of stuff that comes out. And I kind of thought when I first saw it, Jamu, at first that I did have that thought like, oh, wow, this is, this is just white people, white people. And this is white people, you know, being in solidarity with their ideological kinsmen, you know, they feel bad for the white people in the middle of a war now. And and that's all it is. But I looked at the list of endorsers and a lot of those people are not white. And you raised this point, but I thought about this. I think a lot of this, not all, but a lot of this is the result of the effectiveness of the Russiagate campaign. Because it strikes me that these people have this weird, almost illogical hatred of Vladimir Putin that anything he does, they automatically impute it to evil. I didn't, pun not intended, that's just how that came out. But they automatically say it's evil, but, but it's just because the empire told them to. And I kind of trace that back to how deeply convinced these folks must have been in the whole Russiagate influence campaign, because that's what that was. That, that's, and, and it strikes me that if they were really leftists and they really understand that the U.S. empire is the greatest threat to humanity on the planet, why would they care that anybody hacked the elections in this joint? 
I mean, which are already not fair, which are already not open to all of us, which are already not democratic. So let's just say Russia did hack the elections. Why would we care that much? Are we that wedded to this idea of this sham democracy in this country that we'd be up in arms to agree with the empire about why their shitty candidate Hillary Clinton lost an election she should have won in her sleep if she had actually ran a campaign like she gave a damn, right? So I, I'm wondering what you think about that. The fact that for some of these people, I, this is a holdover of Russiagate. I think you're absolutely right that, that it's been, it, it, these are liberals and they operate from a, a liberal um, idealist framework where basically you impute uh, motivations to, to individuals, to personalities, as opposed to those of us who operate uh, objectively, who look at material conditions, who, who look at class and social forces to help us to understand uh, politics. They look at these, these non-material things, what is in someone's head. So, uh, you know, identifying someone, a, a personality, a Putin or a Chi or whatever, uh, and, and making that person the, the symbol of Maduro, the symbol of evil, that is part of the propaganda thrust that they, they utilize. Now, it's understandable that they use that uh, because it's a very effective weapon in trying to uh, influence uh, the, the general population. What is, what is really uh, bizarre is that you have uh, so-called sophisticated left forces that fall for the same thing. You, you would never hear folks from BAP talking about Putin and, and all this kind of crap. We talk about the Russian Federation. You know, we don't talk about, you know, personalities. We look at, at objective structures and institutions. OK, we look at the state, you know, but 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 that is a traditional uh, uh, radical, uh, uh, you know, instrument. These other folks who call themselves radicals, these are basically these are again, these are liberals. And so, yeah, they, they get they and they take this liberal, petty bourgeois, moralistic stance on things. You know, if you don't um, have a certain kind of position, not only are you incorrect politically, you're now morally suspect. Mm -hmm. Well, we say, you know, if you want to play the moral game, we say you must you are morally suspect, align yourself with a nation state that can justify continued support for Israel, that can continue to. Uh, occupy uh, e uh, Iran and Syria that can uh, attack and destroy the most prosperous nation on the African continent, Libya, and have your Secretary of State laugh about it. Okay, that can actively engage in sanctions that are that result in in the the the, the deaths of people around the world who are subjected to these illegal sanctions. You know, and don't tell me, oh, you know, well, we, we, we could do both. We can oppose that and we can oppose uh, uh, the Russians. OK. Yeah. But what you do is you providing ideological cover for for the for, for your enemy. You know, you 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 provide just this, this sort of uh, left uh, rationalization for why people should be opposed to the Russians and the Chinese. What have the Russians and the Chinese done to the U.S. except attempt to play the game? That, that the West laid out there. You know, I tell people in some of my, my, my talks in the community, it, it, it helped them understand this, this, this animus toward the Chinese. I say, how many people know about the attack in, in Tulsa, Oklahoma? Okay. How many people know about uh, the, the assault on Rosewood in Florida? Okay. I said, what was the motivation of white folks in those attacks? We talk about that a little bit. And it comes down to this was economic competition. That these folks did the thing that they were supposed to do as part of the, the capitalist order and did it well. And the reaction from white folks is, we're going to tear your shit up. <laughs> yep. you know, we can't compete with you. So therefore, we're going to attack mm -hmm. you. It's the same motivation uh, with, with the Chinese. You know, what makes the Chinese your enemy? You know, what makes the Russians your enemy? What they do to you? They're not the ones that are killing us every year, okay? Don't be confused. So don't tell me about this balance, both and bullshit. No, no, we don't buy it. You are collaborating with the enemy, whether you know it or not. Now, we're going to try to bring you back, okay? But if you don't, 
If you continue to basically, as I said in the piece I wrote yesterday, if you don't, then basically, if you collaborate with the enemy, it makes you the enemy also. And on that, there should be no compromise and no retreat. And there is none. And this is why I had to have this conversation today uh, with you. And I know I've got to let you go. So where do we go? <laughs> it's funny how the puns, they just keep coming because the ancestors are like, you get here. Um, as Martin Luther King Jr. wrote, where do we go from here, Ajamu? We go to continue organization because basically we said in 2023, we got to have clear lines of demarcation. We can't play with these folks any longer. We got to be, there got to be clarity in terms of, of who the enemy is and where we need to go. We need to start moving toward, even as a formation, a clear commitment to socialist transformation, in my opinion. Mm. This ain't a bad position yet, but I'm saying that's where we need to go. We need to use this, this people-centered human rights framework uh, as a uh, instrument to point out the contradictions of the U.S. state and its inability or reluctance or failure to protect the objective human rights needs of its own people, okay? We need to understand that basically we are at war. These folks have made it very clear that they are willing to fight not only to the last Ukrainian to maintain a global capitalist hegemony, but to, to the last of all of us in these various nations. And we have to understand this, that those of us who are part of the black radical tradition, who are uncompromising in our positions, who are clear in our political objectives, we are going to be increasingly targeted. We see it with the attack on the African People's Socialist Party and, and the, the Black Alliance of Peace because of its effectiveness, its global standing, okay? We've got to understand that we are, we're already under attack to a certain extent, but it's going to intensify and they're going to come through and come in into us and use various, you know, arguments to try to, you know, to, to divide and, and, and confuse folks. We've got to be prepared for that. I think we are, because we like, as you said earlier, we get some of the baddest Africans in this country in this formation. So Africans, I've got to jump. I got to go to, a, yeah. uh, I got to do a, 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 a meeting, a very important one here in Colombia. Uh, talking about um, some internal contradictions as it relates to the, the, the government that we still support and its relationship to the U.S. Uh, and then I got to do a, again, I got to do a thing with, uh, with, with, with Iran because they want to hear and know about some of this stuff also. So, you know, this is what we do. Uh, we are continuing to do our thing. We're going to continue to organize our people, you know, and we tell people when you all uh, want us to back up and, 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 and dance for white folks, uh, we say it ain't happening here, you know. No compromise, no retreat. No compromise, no Ajama retreat. Braca, thank you so much. We'll talk to you again soon. I hope I'm sure there'll be plenty of reason to let me let you go. Thank you, thank you. All right, y'all. Um, so listen, I'm gonna stay on a few uh more minutes. I'm gonna go through some of your comments, and I really appreciate uh Ajamu uh Baraka for coming on and laying down that clear ideological line in the sand. Because listen, I, I understand that people, a lot of people don't have, uh, I don't know. I don't know what it is that, that some people who have been, who are older than me, who have been in the so-called struggle longer than me, who have degrees and, titles behind their name and, you know, this great lexicon of, of body of work way longer than I have. I honestly don't understand how come people could not find the same information I found and do exactly what I did. That's just a portion. That is literally just a portion. You know, we have these kinds of of people <clears throat> talking about we need to both sides this conversation we need to provide balance uh for this conversation and we need to condemn russia for the wagner group well if we're going to talk about the wagner group can we talk about the fbi can can we talk about blackrock how blackrock has entered into i can't even call it an agreement it's they signed a contract to extort 
Ukraine. BlackRock basically owns Ukraine for the rest of the history of that country. So Wagner Group, the, the Wagner, so what are they doing? Oh, so they went into Mali and helped the Malians kick the French out? And, and this is not to say that there might not be valid criticisms of some things that this uh, group uh, from Russia has done. I'm sure there are. It's not that we ignore these internal contradictions. What we do is look at the major primary contradiction that affects all of us right now. And whatever the Wagner group is doing that people have a problem with, it is not on the scale and the level of what the US, the EU and NATO are doing in Ukraine. So it, it's, it's, oh. And then, you know, if it, it blows my mind, the, the black people, the African people, I feel bad calling them African because that's, it's, it's like they haven't even earned that name. They, they have forfeited that title as well. You're not African, you ain't African, not like us. If you are signing on to this Ukrainian solidarity bullshit, understanding the history of Ukraine, the current government of Ukraine, and this idea that because Volodymyr Zelensky is a man of Jewish identity or heritage, that he can't possibly be fascist. In that very same Yale article, um, they point out that Zelensky was elected on a platform of rapprochement with Russia, of returning to friendly, normalized relations with, and that's what the word rapprochement means. So Zelensky, when he was running for president in Ukraine, a part of his platform was, let's end this conflict, let's go back to the friendly relations with Russia that this country had under the Poroshenko, uh, I'm sorry, under the uh, Yanukovych government. Yanukovych was the Ukrainian president who was democratically elected, who had friendly relations with Russia, who was run out of the country by the neo-Nazi fascist right-wing violent mobs of thugs that the United States legitimized, armed, and funded. Yeah. Zelensky ran on going back to those kinds of, uh, that kind of relationship with Russia. What changed? You know what changed? The legitimization of the fascists in Ukraine. So as much as I don't want to make Zelensky a sympathetic figure, because look, he is the one uh, proposing all of the legislation to ban opposition parties and shut down churches and, you know, go after citizens for collusion and treason. But at the same time, I have to recognize that he is also very much a victim of that violently racist and violent right wing that was legitimized in Ukraine since 2014, since the coup in 2014. So, and they, they have literally said, they have said in public that when this war is over, we're going to string him up. So he, he is very much aware that as much as people want to claim that uh, the, uh, the, the, that the right wing doesn't have that big of an influence over the government of Ukraine, Oh, yeah? Let me share this other thing with you. <sighs> you know how I really love my articles? I do. Because I don't want people to ever accuse me of just making shit up. I am very creative, but I'm not this creative. And I do like using sources that, as I said, are not always left-leaning. This is straight from the American conservative. Ugh, I don't want to read any of this shit. But when they talk about how Ukraine bans political opposition, they talk about how it's not just pro-Russian political parties, but individual dissidents who have been dealt with harshly by Ukrainian law and Ukrainian mobs. And I know I have some highlights down here. They talk about... Um, 
some of these incidents of individual people being targeted by the Ukrainian government. Uh, they targeted a supposed malefactor. The malefactor is a 40-year-old woman who, in a private conversation recorded by a person she trusted, said, I'm waiting for Russia. Yes. You know why? Because I'm for Russia and because I am a person of Russian soul. She's now under investigation for acts of collaboration. Similar incident recorded uh, approvingly by Kiev Live on Telegram. Ukrainian border police arrested a man for supporting Russia, exchanging photos and videos of artillery fire and being in the possession of Russian food rations. And here I would encourage people on Facebook to follow the page of someone named Dan Kovalik, K-O-V-A-L-I-K. He recently came from uh, the Donbass and Luhansk regions and he took a lot of video about the rebuilding campaigns that Russia has been undertaking in the regions that Ukraine attacked. Don't hear about that in US media, but yeah, that's happening. So Russia is there feeding people, uh, rebuilding homes, rebuilding schools. Right, okay. Um, she talks about a drunk man brandishing a, a machete who was arrested in Odessa for screaming pro-Russian propaganda. Of course, because she's a conservative, she's very pro-cop and she was glad that the man was arrested. Um, but even she finds it, and the, the author of this article is a woman, she even finds it difficult to see his actions as treason, but he is being treated as someone who has committed treason. She talks about a frightened 34-year-old resident of the area who, is, who has issued a public apology for actively expressing her hate of Ukraine's defenders. Her crime was discovered during routine monitoring of social media, presumably by Ukraine's security services after a conversation with the cops. She put conversation in quotation marks because we're sure that the conversation involved threats, if not physical beating. Uh, she decided to ask forgiveness, I'm sure, in, sh in lieu of losing her life. Uh, there, She talks about uh, um, more of this, but then she points out something very important here. <clears throat> she says, remember, this is a conservative writer. She says, the rule of law in Ukraine is notoriously shaky. It was bad in peacetime, and I doubt the war is helping. In April, Vitaly Kim, the genial-looking governor of uh, Nikola, Nikolaev Oblast city said in an interview with the Ukrainian channel 24, he said today a Russian blogger was shot dead in his car in that city. This means that there are still Russian traders in Ukraine and all traders will be executed. I am not afraid of this world. It will be so, and we will not be able to stop people from shooting traders either. She says that in Ukraine, a man can be tried for sedition in court under the law. Security services assassinated him and a government official called for lynching. Lynchings are taking place with the approval of verified and official telegram channels. She, she has said herself that she's seen no dead bodies, but plenty of humiliation of alleged collaborators and Russian sympathizers. sympathizers. People kneeling and tied to the poles, she means poles, P-O-L-E-S, with plastic wrap, signs of recent beatings, and partially naked bodies in full display. This is a fascist state. Ukraine is a fascist state. And for people who, as I said, uh, have poo-pooed and downplayed the influence, the presence and the influence of neo-Nazis in Ukraine, Back in 2018, there was a commentary published in Reuters that does the exact opposite, that did the exact opposite, didn't. In one paragraph, kind of in the middle, they tried to both sides and this situation can be both things. But when you actually read the article, you understand that this is not an, a, a both sides situation. Both of these, these things that they claim are true can't be true. So what this person says, Josh Cohen uh, in Reuters, and this is only one of several articles from this period of time where US corporate media, yes, even the scribes of the State Department 
were reporting on the neo-Nazi problem in Ukraine. But this one I, I really like because it's pretty, it's pretty uh, uh, detailed. So he says that Kiev must contend with a growing problem behind the front lines, far right vigilantes who are willing to use intimidation and even violence to advance their agendas and who often do so with the tacit approval of law enforcement agencies. And gee, doesn't that look familiar? What'd that look like? who that look like? when that look like? Remember this? Charlottesville. Cohen goes on to say that, um, and of course, because it's, a, it's an imperialist source, they're going to paint the uh, Russian adoption of Crimea, uh, Crimea as uh, uh, an annexation, which means that Russia forcefully took control of Crimea, but they did not. The people in that, that region also voted in a referendum to secede from Ukraine. Why? Because of the right-wing forces that were coalescing in Kiev after the 2014 coup. That's why. And because they also did not want the Ukrainian government to uh, formally uh, be incorporated into the European Union because they understood that if they did, the European Union would impose upon the industrialized regions in Ukraine, those eastern regions, the Donbass, Luhansk, and Crimean regions, their plan of industrial modernization, which meant widespread displacement of working class people. So, Cohen points out in this piece that right-wing militias such as Azov and right sector stepped into the breach after uh, uh, the Crimea conflict, fending off the Russian-backed separatists while Ukraine's regular military regrouped. Though, as a result, many Ukrainians continue to regard the militias with grateful admiration. Remember, these are the same Ukrainians who really love Stepan Bandera and the neo-Nazis to this day. As a result, uh, I'm sorry, the more extreme among these groups promote an intolerant and illiberal ideology that will endanger Ukraine in the long term. Since the Crimean crisis, the militias have been formally integrated into Ukraine's armed forces. But I thought, according to corporate media today, that didn't happen. But some have resisted full integration. Azov, for example, runs its own children's training camp and the career section instructs recruits who wish to transfer to Azov from a regular military unit. So see, it wasn't just us crazy leftists pointing out that this happened in Ukraine. This actually is documented in a very imperialist friendly source. <sighs> According to Freedom House's Ukraine project, numerous organized radical right wing groups exist in Ukraine. Freedom House also not a left source at all. And while the volunteer battalions may have been officially integrated into state structures, some of them have since spun off political and nonprofit structures to implement their vision. Uh, this person from Freedom House noted an increase in patriotic discourse supporting Ukraine in its conflict with Russia has coincided with an apparent increase in both public hate speech, sometimes by public officials, and magnified by the media, as well as violence toward vulnerable groups such as the LGBTQ uh, community. So all this idea, all this conversation that some folks who are screaming for balance when they want to bring up, well, you know, Russia, uh, they're homophobic, Russia's racist. So you don't give a shit about the LGBTQ and other vulnerable groups in Russia who have been targeted by these right-wing neo-Nazis, that's not an issue. You're cool with that because the empire said they're not a problem, but you're concerned about Russia's LGBTQ issues. And this is not to say that Russia doesn't have LGBTQ issues. They do. But that ain't why they are fucking around with Ukraine. That's not why this conflict is going on. Okay, let's keep going, shall we? Uh, a pro-democracy NGO, also not a left source, <laughs> uh, 
reports that active reported at the time that activists are frequently harassed by vigilantes when holding legal meetings or rallies related to politically controversial positions such as the promotion of LGBT rights or opposition to the war. Azov and other militias have attacked anti-fascist demonstrations, city council meetings, media outlets, art exhibitions, foreign students, and the Roma, Roma population, or otherwise known pejoratively as gypsies. I'm just using that for people who don't know who the Roma is, but don't ever use that word. It's disgusting. Progressive activists describe a new climate of fear that they say has been intensifying ever since last year's near-fatal stabbing of anti-war activist Stas Sergeyenko, which is believed to have been perpetrated by an extremist group named C-14. The name refers to a 14-word slogan popular among white supremacists. Same 14-word slogan popular among white supremacists in this bitch right here. Brutal attacks this month on International Women's Day. Yep, they even hate women. Marches in several Ukrainian cities uh, prompted an unusually forceful statement from Amnesty International, also not a left source, which warned that the Ukrainian state is rapidly losing its monopoly on violence. The, even you, Amnesty International was saying the Ukrainian state is incredibly violent toward the ethnic regions in its own country, but they have legitimized these right-wing fascist groups in their country to the point that they don't have a monopoly on violence anymore. Imagine that. Cohen goes on to say that Ukrainian extremists are rarely punished for acts of violence in some cases, such as C-14's January attack on, remembrance, on a remembrance gathering for two murdered journalists. Yes, they also murdered journalists. Police actually detain peaceful demonstrators instead. To be clear, the Kremlin's claims that Ukraine is a hornet's nest of fascists are false. This is the bullshit in the article. This is the imperialist bullshit. Because you can't say that all of what they just he just highlighted is true. And that there is not just a small problem of right-wing fascist violence in the country, but that is big, it is growing, it is emboldened and legitimized by the Ukrainian state, and then turn around and say, oh, Ukraine is not a hornet's nest of fascists. He has to include this imperialist bullshit because, you know, he doesn't want to seem like he's being an apologist for Putin. Um, <laughs> and, and this is the claim we have heard from the left, right? That, that far-right parties didn't even win a whole lot of seats in the Ukrainian parliamentary, uh, parliamentary election. And Ukrainians were shocked about the national mil militias demonstration, the little torch thing in Kiev. But then he turns right around and says, but connections between law enforcement agencies and extremists give Ukraine's Western allies ample reason for concern. <laughs> so Ukrainian law enforcement are working with the extremists because, you know, the extremists are a part of Ukrainian law enforcement and Ukrainian law enforcement is supported by the government. They are the enforcement arm of the Ukrainian government. And even this guy in trying to dismiss the problem and the influence of the violent right wing in Ukraine admits that Ukraine's Western allies, namely the United States, the EU and NATO have ample reason for concern. Get the fuck out of, how are you gonna sit there and tell me Howie Hawkins and the rest of y'all endorsing this bullshit Ukraine Solidarity Network that these are not issues we should raise, be concerned with and be the foundation for our refusal to collude with the imperialists ever in any way, but particularly on this issue. Mm. He goes on to say C-14 and Kiev's city government recently signed an agreement allowing C-14 to establish a municipal guard to patrol the, street, the streets. Three such militia-run guard forces are already registered in Kiev and at least operate in 21 other, or at least 21 operate in other cities. And that was in 2018. 
As one Ukrainian analyst noted in December, control of these forces make uh, Avakov, and this person was the opponent to the then president, the coup president, the president that the United States propped up in that audio recording of the phone call that Victoria Nuland made choosing the next president of Ukraine after uh, uh, Yanukovych was run out of Ukraine. It was Poroshenko that the U.S. chose. And Victoria Nuland said in that cold phone call, fuck the EU. I don't care what they want. We want Poroshenko. And that's who's going to be the president. And Lo and behold, look who was the next president of Ukraine. But even he, with the backing of the United States, could not control the right wing in Ukraine, the right wing that the United States legitimized, funded, and armed in order to overthrow the Yanukovych government. Uh, Ukrainian analysts note, noted in December, control of these forces make Avakov uh, extremely powerful, and Poroshenko's presidency might not be strong enough to withstand the kind of direct confrontation with Avakov that an attempt to oust him or to strike at his power base could well produce. Poroshenko at that point in 2018 has endured frequent verbal threats, including calls for revolution from ultra-nationalist groups, so he may believe that he needs Avakov to keep them in check. Uh, and let me scroll up just really quickly here. Oh, here we go. Whoops. I wanted to make sure I explained to you who Avakov is. <clears throat> because uh, Cohen points out that in an ideal world, President uh, Petro Poroshenko would purge the police and the interior military of far-right sympathizers, including interior minister Arsen Avakov. That's who he was at the time, who has close ties to Azov leader Andriy Beletsky as well as Sergei Koret's kids, I'm so butchering that name, but they're fascists, so I don't give a shit, an Azov veteran who is now a high-ranking police official. So, so what? That the right, far right parties didn't gain much in the elections. They were prominent in Ukrainian law enforcement. And they were powerful enough that even the U.S. selected president, Petro Poroshenko, felt that he could not purge them. He could not control them. So he didn't. He felt like he needed to keep them there to keep the right wing in check. So that's what's going on with Zelensky to a degree today. But remember, Zelensky won his election. He campaigned on returning to normalized, friendly relations with Russia. So he went into this knowing very well the, uh, the influence of the fascist right, of the fascists in Ukraine, understanding what happened with Poroshenko, and he went into it willingly. So there was only so much of him being a victim that I'm going to give him here. Cohen <clears throat> ends his piece saying there's no easy way to eradicate the virulent far right extremism that has been poisoning Ukrainian politics and public life. But without vigorous and immediate efforts to counteract it, it may soon endanger, it may soon endanger the state itself. And look at where we are. I don't know what else anybody else want me to say about this whole ridiculous mess. I'm, I'm very confused about um, the willingness of so many on the so-called left to uh, not just repeat uh, the empire's talking points about this conflict in Ukraine, um, which, remember, could have been avoided if Ukraine had only abided by the Minsk Accord requirement to give Donbass and Luhansk the special status and autonomy that they literally voted for. That's it. That all, that's all Ukraine had to do. These issues of uh, NATO encroachment and uh, uh, on, on Russia's 
uh, territorial security, I think those conversations would have continued on. From what it seems like to me, from what Putin has said, from what Sergei Lavrov has have said, from what every Russian diplomat has said, from what even the G7 acknowledged, the, the major sticking point was the refusal of Ukraine to give Donbass and Luhansk the territorial uh, uh, independence and sovereignty that they voted for. That, that would have avoided all of this. But here we, here we are. And before I go, and thank you all for sticking with me for longer than an hour because I'm pissed off. Can you tell? Can you tell I'm pissed off? Because I'm sick of these latte leftists. Believing that because they have years in this movement, because they, uh, uh, they have this track record of whatever it is they consider activism, because you know they have titles behind or before their names and they have big platforms and, and whatever reason they have for telling actual anti-imperialists that we are morally wrong in not supporting Ukraine in their just war against Russian aggression, these people have lost their fucking minds if they think they have any kind of moral standing to stand up on their flimsy motherfucking soapbox and tell actual African anti-imperialists that we are misguided about who the fuck our enemy is. We're clear on who our enemy is. Our enemy is and always has been U.S. imperialism. And in this case, where these mostly white but some black so-called leftists are happily siding with a fascist state, because quite literally because they hate Vladimir Putin, because in their minds, he is a boogeyman. He is the boogeyman then they're the enemy too. They absolutely are. And there really is no equivocation about that. So another reason this um, Ukraine Solidarity Network is just repulsive. Um, th these are the principles and goals uh, they say they hold to. Let me share my screen again so you don't think I'm making it up. <laughs> Whoops, there we go. This is, and I only have this up for reference. I'm not endorsing this shit. That, that fuck no. Oh, this is just so ridiculous. Um, Oh, where, where is the, where is the, I want to, oh, there it is. Okay. I want to make sure I get to a certain part in this, their demands, their principles and goals. They say we strive for a world free of global, global power domination at the expense of smaller nations. So never mind what the U.S., the EU and NATO has done throughout the entire existence of NATO. The very reason that NATO was formed was to do exactly what they claim they strive for a world free of. NATO was formed uh, to bully smaller nations into being subservient to U.S. Uh, European, what uh, John Mubaraka calls the pan-European project of imperialist hegemony. That's why NATO was formed. It's not a defensive agency. The rest of the world, nations in the world weren't threatening the U.S. and European nations. Ugh. They say we oppose war and authoritarian uh, and authoritarianism, no matter which state it comes from. So they, they don't oppose the war that was imposed upon the people in Donbass and Luhansk. They don't give a shit about that and support the right to, of self-determination and self-defense de for any oppressed nation. Again, 
They don't care about the right to self-determination of the people in Donetsk and Luhansk and Crimea. They, they didn't care about the self-determination of those people. They just sad about the white people in Ukraine who, oh, they say we support Ukraine's victory against the Russian invasion. And it's right to reparations, this right here. These motherfuckers support the right of Ukraine, a fascist state in the past and today. Their right to reparations to meet the cost of reconstruction after the colossal destruction in it suffered. Get the entire fuck out of I told you the cuss words were coming because I... I don't see any need to be diplomatic in talking about this bullshit, this clear allegiance to pan-European white, pan-European white grievance bullshit. That's what this is. These people who signed on to this network, this uh, Ukraine solidarity network, I don't recall them demanding reparations for the people in Libya to what the United States and NATO did to those Africans. Do you? Correct me if I'm wrong. I'm always open to being incorrect and always open to being corrected because a good revolutionary is not averse to comradely correction. So if I'm wrong about these people not calling for reparations for Libyans, please let me know. But you and I know damn well I'm not wrong because none of these people who have signed on to this Ukraine Solidarity Network, Howie Hawkins, none of these people ever call for reparations for Libya. Have they called for reparations for the U.S. drone bombings in Somalia? Have they called for reparations for Syria? Have they called for reparations for Palestinians? Shit, have they called for reparations for Africans in this part of the diaspora who are gunned down by, by the police for a year? As, as, as I know I said Uri, for <laughs> a year, as Ajamu pointed out. No, but they are supportive of Ukraine's right to reparations. That is just pan-European white grievance allegiance and I, I don't I don't know what else to call that and it doesn't matter that there are black people who sign on to this ridiculousness but I just really think that some of those folks could not possibly have read that and thought critically about hmm, what have any of these people said about reparations for the Africans throughout this world and the indigenous people and the Afro-descended people in the global South and all around the world who have been victims of US and Western imperialism. Have they said much about reparations for those people? <sighs> they go on to say that the reconstruction of Ukraine also demands the cancellation of his debts, uh, of its debts. Uh, to international financial institutions. Hold on. Thank you. I just, I, I'm not ignoring your comments. I'm just in my bag. I'm sorry. Um, you know, I got tunnel vision when I'm in my bag. You know, that's how I do. And I apologize. Uh, but I just saw this comment because I was going to go right there. Haiti deserves billions and trillions of reparations from the United States and France and all their friends today. Haiti's debts need to be canceled. African nation's debts to the IMF, every single one of them need to be canceled. Have we heard any of these people who have signed on to this Ukraine Solidarity Network and this particular demand, have they applied the same demand for the cancellation of a nation's debt? to any other country that is indebted to the criminal international monetary fund and the World Bank? Fuck no. They have not.
They say that <clears throat> aid to Ukraine must come without strings attached, above all, without crushing debt burdens. And, and it's wild because this kind of thing is the very thing that African people, African descended people and indigenous people are fighting against in countries where people are rising up against their neoliberal right wing governments that are backed by the United States right now to this day. They're fighting against austerity policies imposed by the IMF and their loan restructuring schemes. Zimbabwe, anybody? Zimbabwe? Then they go on to say, we recognize the suffering that this war imposes on people of Russia. They don't give a damn about people of Russia. Most intensely on ethnic and religious minority sectors of the Russian Federation, which are disproportionately disproportionately impacted by forced military conscription. And it's interesting that they would bring this up, but they don't bring up the fact that Ukraine barred men between the ages of, I think it was 16 and 60, from leaving the regions, their regions and cities in their countries so that they could be forced to serve in the Ukrainian army. But, but we're supposed to be having a conversation about balance, right? We're supposed to be having a balanced conversation, but these people ain't engaged in that kind of a conversation. We salute the brave Russian anti-war forces speaking out and demonstrating in the face of severe repression, and we are encouraged by the popular resistance to the draft of soldiers to become cannon fodder for Putin's war of aggression. Again, nothing about the Ukrainian conscription, conscription. nothing about that. Go on to say, we build, uh, we seek to build connections to progressive organizations and movements in Ukraine with and with the labor movement which represents the biggest part of Ukrainian civil society and to link Ukrainian civic organizations, marginalized communities and trade unions with counterpart organizations of the United States. We support Ukrainian struggles for ensuring just and fair labor rights for its population, especially during the war, as there are no military reasons to impl implement laws that threaten the social rights of Ukrainians, including, including those who are fighting on the front line. So it's interesting that they sort of kind of allude to a little bit in a very light fashion, the fascist laws restricting the rights of the very people they want, they claim they want to support, labor unions, workers movements, uh, marginalized communities and trade unions, uh, civic organizations in Ukraine, but they don't go into detail about the ways that the Ukrainian government has actually Remove these people's rights, completely obl obliterated them. Ah, oh, don't believe me? Okay. <clears throat> Where is it? Ukraine's anti worker law, law 5371, which strips back labor protections was ratified in August 2022. Mm -hmm. This is at open democracy. You mean to tell me Howie Hawkins and his friends couldn't find that? Sure they could have. Uh, let's see here. Oh, I'm sorry. No, not that one. There we go. No, not that one. Where'd the other one go? <clears throat> oh, yeah, we talked about Ukraine banning political op opposition. Uh, I think there was, uh, where is it? I don't have that one, I don't think. Oh, here it is. Here's the other one. Ukraine revokes the citizenship of 13 Russian priests, or they say they're Russian priests. Uh, Ukraine has voked, uh, Volodymyr Zelensky, they are uh, a clear to name, has revoked the Ukrainian citizenship of 13 clerics of the Russian-affiliated Ukrainian church. 
The priests who haven't fled may be expelled from Ukraine just for being priests and ethnic Russians. Uh, this was done on December 2nd. Since November, Ukraine has conducted nationwide raids on religious sites that belong to the Russian controlled church, which during which authorities say they have so far found Russian passports, if they're ethnic rough, of course they would have Russian anti-Ukrainian propaganda. Remember the civil war that the Ukrainian government waged against the people in the eastern regions of Ukraine. I guess they'd be mad about that shit. Uh, Anti-Ukrainian propaganda, and they claim a stolen collection of icons. <sighs> okay, anyway, searches have also taken place at the Moscow Patriot Patriarchate controlled uh, Kiev Perchersk Lavra. It's worth noting that uh, I believe it was Steve Bannon uh, and other U.S. right wing uh, forces that helped create the Ukrainian Orthodox Church uh, in opposition to the Orthodox Church that existed in Ukraine before. You mean to tell me all of the information that I shared with y'all in this, woo, we've been going for an hour and 40 minutes, y'all. All this information that I, I was able to scare up sitting at my computer, at my desk, in my house, you mean to tell me Howie Hawkins with all his experience and being in left politics and all these people who have signed on to support this Ukraine Solidarity Network, all these people, some of these people quite noteworthy in left anti-war activism, a lot of, a lot of black folks. You mean to tell me they didn't have access to all of this information? Bullshit. Yes, they did. They did. And <clears throat> I'm not in these people's minds. I can't tell you why, definitively, why they have made the decision to take the position they have other than what it looks like to me. It looks very much to me like uh, these people, and I'm sorry, I'm just being petty now because I can, because, you know, this is my show. I can be petty if I want. <laughs> Some of these organizations that they represent, <sighs> these people have decided to pledge their allegiance to the pan-European hegemonic project that the US, the EU, and NATO are head of, that they direct. And even though some of the people and the organizations represented on this list are not European organizations. Um, some are organizations that purport to represent the interests and people that report to represent the interests of African people in this part of the diaspora. I don't see how they can by signing on to this project. Because this project, I think, is a, a very important example of the lack of intellectual honesty, the lack of clear just dialectical materialism that's floating around on the left like a disease, like a virus. It's, it's more virulent than COVID, this, this, this intellectual uh, uh, laziness and this lack of dialectical materialism that people are just... So these folks, these latte left liberals um, have really expressed their allegiance to pan-Europeanism. And the black folks that have signed on to this mess have done so without the kind of intellectual uh, rigor 
that they needed to have applied to it, uh, that they should have applied to this conflict from the very beginning, um, but that they have refused to because I think for some of these people, they find some utility. They can see some uh, political positioning in their hopefully getting a piece of the pie of the pan-European project. I'm thinking that some of these people will feel like, well, maybe, maybe the empire will leave us alone to do whatever it is we want to do. But I can't believe wholly and entirely that they're that stupid to think that they can negotiate with the enemy in such a manner. Because nothing that they could want to do for the people, if they are being sincere in their work, would ever be sanctioned and allowed. There's nothing that is truly for the people that would affect the material conditions or improve the material conditions of the people and really undermine and weaken the hold that capitalism has on and over our people, and they're not going to be allowed to do any of that shit. So I'm thinking that they're willing to just not do any of that shit for whatever check they think they're going to get. And I'm sure people are going to have some things to say about me from that little analysis, but oh well. <laughs> This is not a, a, a both sides, um, we need to critique both sides kind of argument. I think I, I, I hope, I hope very much that I have disabused you viewers of the idea that this has ever been a balanced conversation because it's never been a balanced conflict. Regardless of whatever internal issues there are that exist in Russia, and there are some. When it comes to this conflict with Ukraine, it has never been a fair fight. It has never been a balanced conversation. The people entering into negotiations never entered into those negotiations with Russia with balanced or fair intentions, never. They admitted that. I showed you that they admitted that. So I don't understand how people on the so-called left can come to the conclusion that we need to consider both sides or this is it's it's both and 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 you know and especially come to the conclusion that Russia is our enemy. It is an enemy that we need to side with the empire against. There is never a reason good enough to side with our oppressors over. And as revolutionaries, I, I don't know how that's not clear, but apparently it's not. Well, maybe because those people are obviously not revolutionaries. I would say they're maybe not even organizers. They're opportunists. That's what I think. They're opportunists. Some of the people are, I think, misguided and deluded and do not have all of the information that they should have. They haven't done their homework and they refuse to. And I can't do anything about that. All I can do is do what I just did. All I can do is provide my service, do my part as an organizer to provide my part of this political education so that you can make an informed decision about where you stand, on which side of the barricade you stand when it comes to the empire. Whether you support the pan-European hegemonic project and you're gonna side with Ukraine and their plucky little fight against evil Vladimir Putin or are you going to actually apply a solid analysis with the facts that the empire itself provides and be clear on where you stand on this issue um, of where you are in this fight 
uh, between the Empire and the rest of us. So that's all I got. <clears throat> Thank you all so much for hanging out with me for all this additional time. <sighs> it felt so good to get that off my chest because I was pissed for two days. <laughs> When this thing, when I saw this thing and I saw the people who had signed on to this foolishness. So thank you for allowing me and, and hanging out with me and uh, my special guest, Dejamu Baraka, um, venting on this very troubling development in this ongoing conflict uh, <laughs> involving Ukraine. So look, uh, yeah, stay tuned to Luke Mon Nation, Black Power Media for all kinds of good things to come. And until next time, folks, ah, uh, luta continua. The struggle show enough continues, but Victoria Acerta, victory is certain. Peace. <laughs>